Okay, we all set? Good, good. I don't know if you have many of you have ever used this phrase, uh, and this phrase is not complimentary, okay? So just bear with me. Have you heard people, or have you been described as one who rushes in where angels fear to try? I've done that before. And it's, you know, I think I've got all the answers. I come in, I'm going to take care of things just to realize that I don't have any of the answers. I don't even know the question yet. And yet we, you, people rush in and, and really, that can almost scare you. You have no clue what's coming and they think they know what they're doing. And they show up, they don't ask questions. They come in, they start doing and they really think they know a lot more than they do. And I, I will give uh, some credit to some, some people like this. Um, they really mean well, often. They mean well. And I've experienced this recently, people meaning well, but it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to work with people because they genuinely are trying, but they're messing things up. And that is a very hard place to put yourself in. You need people who really, they, they want to listen. They're willing to, to come along and hear you say, look, this is the task. This is how I want it. This is what I'm wanting. And then they can jump in and be a help to you. We need that. There have been a lot of instances where people have They've wanted to help me out of, you know, here at the church even with projects. And I'm grateful for that. I am so grateful for people wanting to step up and help. That's a good thing. And the people desire to do a good job. They wanted to encourage me. They wanted to be helpful. And they wanted to do it in a way that would be pleasing. But when a person is either, and these, I can get some more direct words at this point, when a person is not teachable, when they don't desire to learn, or I guess a nastier term might be when they're just pigheaded and they don't want to listen to instructions, it, that can be a recipe for disaster. In my opinion, in my opinion, one of the worst areas that this can happen with is when we're dealing with people. When there are people problems, when people are hurting and you're trying to help people along, that cannot happen. That is a definite recipe for disaster. A verse we use often, and if, if whenever there is counseling instruction given, understand this is the verse. Proverbs 18, 13, he that hears a matter, he that answers a matter before he hears it, paraphrasing, he's a shameful fool. It's folly and shame to him. To jump into someone's problems and, and not ask questions and not to actively listen, to seriously try to figure out what's going on in their life. When we jump into something like that without knowing, we're setting ourselves up to be that shameful fool. And we can do that sometimes inadvertently. If I'm working with someone and someone else comes along as a third party and they want to get involved and put in their two cents based on whatever they know or don't know. It's kind of like uh, what we call an armchair quarterback. We think we've got all the answers and you don't even know the questions. Normally, things get messed up. And often that third party coming in is the one that's being the shameful, Proverbs 18, 13, that shameful fool. You and I need to be willing to, in that case, let the person running it, running it, doing the project, let them run. Let them do their thing. Come along and support. Follow the path they're heading down. 
And if they're going the wrong way, and this is where this illustration totally breaks down, if they're going the wrong way, pull them aside later and say, hey, maybe try this. Maybe think this way. Maybe you're missing something. This is where that illustration is going to break down. Here's the point that I'm heading to. God has a plan that he is working. You and I, and God's plan is perfect. He's not going to mess it up. He's not going to get anything wrong. We need to get on board with God's plan and come alongside, if you will, and, and assist where on our level we can. We need to be involved in furthering God's kingdom and furthering God's desires. If we have become his followers, and I'm not taking that for granted that everyone has. I understand that. But if we have become a follower of Jesus, mark my word, what you signed up for, it was not, it was not to just avoid hell. What we sign up for when we say, I want to be a follower of Jesus we are signing up to put aside self. We are signing up to die to self. As that song was talking about, we, you know, he, we give our all to him. That's what we're signing up for, taking up your cross and following Jesus. That is the only way for us to properly live for him in, a, in an acceptable manner. It is dying to self and following Jesus. Now today, we are going to start looking, we're in the middle of this passage right now, but we're going to start looking at this importance of following God's blueprint. How important is it that we do things in a way that he is honored, in a way that he has commanded? How important is this? And this is seen primarily in how you and I deal with people around us, like, like today. God is nowhere near so concerned as you know, with this facility. This is just a place. This is just walls where we come and get in out of the weather so we can work with people. People, are that's the issue. That is the building that God is primarily concerned with. He wants you and me to be conformed to his image. He wants us being like Jesus. And, and here's, the, here's the hard part for us sometimes. God, he will judge everybody. Everybody is going to be judged. And when God does that judgment, his judgment is going to be absolutely perfect. I can snow you. I can trick you into thinking here is my motive. I can manipulate. I can do all kinds of things that are evil. And you may not notice it. God knows those intents. God knows those motives. And that is the, that's where he, the level he's going to go to as he judges us. So it behooves us to know what is it that God expects? What does God want? What is God seeking as I go through life and seek to fulfill his desires? That's what we're going to see today. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our text. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for loving us. I thank you that Lord, despite what all is going on in our lives in this sin-cursed world, you are good, you care about us, you are conforming us. Lord, help us to submit to that. Help us to have a passion to know you better and to follow you wholly. Father, I, I ask for your help as we look into your word this morning. Would you please... Use the preaching of your word to strengthen each person's faith in this room. Help us to draw closer to you as a result of this time. Lord, use your word to convict, to encourage whatever the need is in this room. Would you please minister to each person? 
And Lord, I pray that you would help me as I preach, help my words to be accurate, help me not to be a distraction to the message that you desire to have given. Lord, use this time in some way to bring glory to yourself and strength to us. Just thank you again, Lord, for loving us. And I just ask again for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's do a quick review. We'll get your notes caught up if you've just got the handout, and then we'll get into the, the new text. Last week, we saw how we build the church is serious. How we build the church is serious. And your first point under that was how we serve matters. Verse number 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, as a skillful builder who could do all parts of this building, Paul is saying, I laid the foundation, another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. Literally, you be careful how you build on God's foundation. You be careful what you add, because that, that, that base, we'll see that the next point, is Jesus. And we've got to be extremely cautious, careful how we build. But we'll see this today. You are building. Whether you like it or not, whether you're trying or not, you're building. And we need to be extremely careful how we serve matters. Your application statement is filled with, controlled by the Holy Spirit. We'll be, we will continue building on the same foundation as Paul which is Jesus. Then we saw verse 11, only Jesus is sufficient. For no other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the foundation. Paul preached numerous times. He preached Jesus crucified. That's his message. The whole gospel message is summed up with that Jesus crucified. You and I, we, we, we finished last week looking at Matthew 7, 24 to 27. If you want to be firm in your faith, it comes as we have our feet in that parable planted on the rock, as we hear what he says and we do it. If we hear what he says and we go and do our own thing, we have our feet planted on sand and we're, great's going to be the fall of that person. So application statement here, Jesus' redemptive work must be primary in our teaching and our outreach. And that brings us to the passage we're looking at today. God's judgment will be severe. God's judgment will be severe. And when I say severe here, I'm not talking like in, a mean, in a mean necessarily way. I don't mean it in that sense. God takes our service, or we might say our lack thereof at times. He takes our service extremely seriously. Now, common thinking that I have experienced with people is that God is going to overlook things. God understands. God knows I'm busy. God knows how, how awful my husband is. He knows how awful this, but he knows how hard things are. God will understand, and by that meaning, he's going to overlook my laziness. I don't want to get busy trying to further the kingdom of God. I don't want to be involved. I'm just lazy. God's going to overlook that. He's going to overlook my this lack of concern that I may have for what is important to him. If something matters to God and I blow it off, it's not important as important to me. God's not going to overlook that. People think that God is going to overlook our misplaced priorities. All this can be summed up. He's going to overlook my selfishness. Life's all about me. I do what I want. And God's just going to overlook these things. Whatever is keeping me from proper desiring to and properly building his church, God will overlook it. He's just a loving, grandfatherly type figure who doesn't judge sin. Nothing is further from the truth. God is going to judge. And we're going to see in these passages some of what that is going to be looking like. Because God is going to, I'll just use this phrase, he's going to lay everything bare. 
there is going to be nothing that he does not see and that he does not know and that he does not address. God is going to just lay it bare. We love to emphasize, and, and rightly so, we should emphasize God is a God of love. He is a God of grace. He is a God of mercy. And if you don't understand those truths, I would suggest that you're probably not a follower of Jesus. He ha we have to have this loving God. We have to have a God who is full of grace. Without that, we don't have a hope. But we can't stop there. The scripture teaches a God of justice. The scripture teaches a God who we are to fear. That's really hard. In my finite mind, it's hard to balance this. He loves me, but I better fear him. It comes together. It works. And, and I, hopefully we can see this today. Every one of us in this room, every one of you, regardless of where you're at in your relationship with Jesus, you will stand before Jesus one day. It is going to happen. Now, those of us who have this have a relationship with him, you will stand before him at the Bema seat. The Bema seat judgment, that's where you want to be. Okay, the Bema seat is, that's where we go. This is what we're going to be looking at today. This is where our works are judged. This is where the motives, what we did, et cetera. This is where those things are judged, not our souls. The other side, those who don't know Jesus, they will stand at the great white throne judgment. That's where we want no one to stand. Everyone at the great white throne judgment will be condemned. There is no hope. That is the end of their eternal life and they will go into eternal death at that moment we obviously want to be at the bema seat and it may be that at that bema seat that's where we're told in revelation that god is one day going to wipe away all tears maybe that's where some of these tears are going to come from so we're going to understand we didn't do half, well, anywhere near what we thought we were. He is going to judge all of it and expose it. And there's going to be sorrow. If you're content this morning with not building for him, with not serving him, if this doesn't affect you, it may be that you, you've never entered into a relationship with him. And, and we can help you with that. So let's look at these verses. Uh, start at first, the first point under this. And we're going to cover two of them today. The substance of our judgment. The substance of our judgment. Verse number 12. If any man builds upon this foundation. Okay, that foundation is talking about Jesus. If we build on this foundation of Jesus... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. I know that's mid-sentence, but we're going to stop at this verse for now. If, if we are, he's showing us here, the type of things we can build with. Every one of us, every one of us in this room who is a follower of Jesus, you are, not you can, you are contributing to this building project. You're, you're involved in this that we're discussing. All of us, we're having a part in building onto the lives of those around us. So we build into individual lives in, in our context here. And as we build into individual lives, we're building into this local church. And as we build this local church, you know, this goes beyond what we can do a lot of control over. We build onto the universal church, the bride of Christ. We, we are building onto this body that Jesus has died for. The point is, you and I, we are all building. That is what we're created to do. We're created to work. We're created to serve. Turn real quick, uh, Ephesians 2. Ephesians chapter 2. 
these are some of the key verses. When we, when we witness to people, these are verses that normally will come up in our discussion. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we can, that is so needed for people to hear today. You do absolutely nothing for your salvation. What we bring to the table is our filth. We need the grace of God to receive us and to save us because we're hopeless and we can't do anything. We need him desperately you can't work for it however however verse number 10 we are his workmanship after you've received jesus as your savior you are created in him unto good works we are to do good works and it's not just this is a good thing this would be a it'd be a nice thing if you did this the last part he has ordained this is, that's a, that's a very serious word. We, he has ordained this, that we would serve him. He's ordained that we walk in these good works. So the, these works that, he's, that we should do, he, this is the will of God in your life. This building process that we are to be involved in, in each other's lives, this is God's will for you. If we neglect this, if we choose not to be involved in the building of God's church, his people, if we choose not to be involved in building his kingdom, like it or not, you're still putting building materials, building materials. Back in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12, you're putting some of these materials onto that foundation, which is Jesus Christ. This verse is talking about the building materials. Now, some people look at these, you know, the gold, silver, precious stones. And I, I read a couple of guys, so they, they wanted to try to figure out what did that symbolize? Don't waste your time, okay? It doesn't symbolize anything specific. It's not like the gold stands for. And all. what he's telling us is you've got some materials that are precious. You've got some materials that aren't so precious. That's all that he's bringing up here. We do know some things about these materials. Gold, silver, we know what those are. Precious stones. I was reading recently in Revelation, and it's talking about the new temple that God's going to build with all these stones and, you know, the one pearl being a gate. That's going to be awesome to see. That's not what he's talking about here. These precious stones, the, the, the wording that he has here is referring to building stones, like the granite, the marble. It's not... Have you, ever seen, have you ever gone through the country and you see where somebody has the ruins of a house left over and they've taken field stones and they built the foundation and, a, and the, uh, the fireplace? This is not going to have, that's not what we're to build with. We're to build with the precious stones, the granite, the marble. And if you notice, those are the kind of things that were used in the temple. God wanted precious things, the gold, the silver, the precious stones. And that is what, the temple was made up of. All these things are precious. And then he mentions the wood. Okay, there's your door frames, your, you know, things that are, can burn up. You've got the, the, the wood, the hay is what would get mixed in with mud to fill in where the walls are. The straw is what goes on the top of the cheap houses that you know, you see in the movies, they shoot an arrow that's on fire and everything just burst into flames. It's a good picture. You are building with some of these things. And notice the comparison we've got. You've got those first three that are lasting. You've got the second three that are fail, that are frail. You've got permanent versus temporary. The first ones are inflammable. They can't burn. The third one, the last section they all burn up. The first ones, they cost a lot. The second ones are cheap. So really what we're looking at with this list in verse 12, you've got things that are valuable versus things that are worthless. Replace them. People today, again, this is an in my opinion moment. 
We are extremely content to build cheap. We like cheap. We like not, we like to do things that don't cost us anything. We don't like to invest. Let me just tell you, if you want to make a difference in the kingdom of God, if you want to be used of him, if you want to have materials that are valuable, the gold, silver, the precious stones, you need to invest. You need to be serious minded about following Jesus. It's not a cheap process. Now, some aspects of you know, how, how are we going to invest? How do we work in such a way that is valuable, that is pleasing to God? Well, I'll give you a few. And these aren't from this verse, from these verses, just some, just some uh, practical tips. First thing, you better make sure your message is pure. Doctrine. Some people don't like that word anymore. You know, doctrine's a good word. Our doctrine must be pure. Turn, turn with me again quickly. Uh, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter four, probably the last letter Paul wrote. Second Timothy four, last chapter of the last message of Paul, and he's telling his son in the faith, Timothy, I'm charging you, therefore, before God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, it is appearing in his kingdom. Here's what I want from you. This is what you need to think on. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort. How? With all long suffering, yes. Be patient with people and doctrine. We are to give truth for the time's going to come. Tell me if this doesn't sound like today. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they'll turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be turned unto fables. That's our country. This is what people are looking for in churches today. The, the, the message of the gospel is, a, is, is not important to them. I'm going to tell you what they're doing. They're, they're, they're building, but it's wood, hay, stubble, and it's going to burn. Doctrine matters. We must intentionally be seeking to equip each other to do the work of the ministry, not to tickle ears. We also need to look at our motives. You know, are we striving to please God and to glorify him? Or are we wanting a pat on the back? Is it about us? Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That should be our passion. Our conduct, yeah, the conduct matters. Is conduct good? Is conduct bad? 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we're going to be judged based on that conduct. It matters. So this foundation, back in 1 Corinthians 3, our foundation is a person. It's Jesus. That is what we're building on. And what we're building on it is people. We're building people. So how do we do it? We do it by getting involved in people's lives. We do it by discipling and being discipled. It's a two-way street that needs to happen. So you, you got to ask yourself some hard questions. Are we investing in the kingdom? Or are we just observing? Are you laboring for Jesus? Or are you loitering? You're doing one of the two. And so often, don't fall into this. We love to say, well, kind of right in the middle. No, you're not. You're not in the middle. You're in one or the other. You're laboring or you're loitering. Take your pick. But we are going to be judged on these things. I think some people, I may be wrong on this. I may be wrong. I think some people get nervous. They hear this phrase used, you need to labor for the Lord. You need to be working. You need to be actively serving Jesus. And we get nervous. I only have so much time. How can I get involved in everything? And, you got a wrong idea of laboring. 
Can I encourage you on your own? Go to Matthew 11. You can write this down and go read it later. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Jesus made it really clear. Come unto me. All you who are laboring, you're striving so hard to make things right. It's not working. You come to me and I'll give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. No, that means you're going to be working. You're going to be laboring, but his yoke, her, uh, original meanings from these words, his yoke fits right. It's comfortable. We can serve him, and that's where we find our rest. That's where we find our encouragement. Jesus gives us rest right smack dab in the middle of serving him and laboring for him. And when we choose not to, you've got no rest. We need to be laboring for him if we are his child. And just as a side thing, I don't bring this up a lot at all. This is not just talking about, you know, serve the Lord, give to him financially. That, this is not what this is talking about. This means get involved with people's lives. Build people. This is what we're going to be judged on. Your application statement is the will of God that we invest in the spiritual welfare of others for all of our Christian life. It is his will. And that invest, take that exactly how I wrote it. It is an investment. It will cost you. That's where your joy is going to come from. As you are submitting to the spirit of God working in and through you. Your second point, there's no secrets with God. Verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. This verse should be a wake up call for every one of us here. Some people act like, you know, they're nervous about building with that worthless material. They don't want to, they don't want to fail. So I'm just going to stay to myself and do nothing. That way I don't mess up. I'll just be, I'll be okay. That's not true. You're building. You're building. If you really think that you can just stay on the sideline and not impact other people, you're fooling yourselves. And you can use whichever analogy you want to use. Here, he's using the analogy of building. It would be the same analogy when, when we talk about, you know, get off the sideline and get in the fight. Get in the game. Get working. Whichever analogy you like to use, you go for it. You can't sit on the sidelines. You can't loiter. Here's what happens. Other people will watch you do nothing. And guess what? You're building in that person's life. You're showing them this is okay. You don't have to get serious about serving Jesus. You just sit back, do nothing, be a sideline Christian, and it's, it's all all right. So you're building some worthless, worthless rewards. That's what you're building at that point. So understand, if you're a follower of Jesus, every day, every day, you are placing building materials onto that foundation that he's given to you. You're putting materials onto the foundation of Jesus. And all of us in this illustration, using the building, think of it this way. We're building this house and we're going to present this to Jesus one day. We're going to say, here's my work. Here's what I've done for you. And what God is going to do is he's going to inspect your building. He's going to look at your building. So the question is, what's going to happen to all this material? What's going to happen to all the labor or lack thereof that you are accountable for, that you've done on this earth. He uses some specific words here. Notice the word everywhere. Every man's work will be made manifest. That manifest, it means evident. It's going to be obvious for everybody to see. It's manifest. It's going to be declared. 
That word means to show something clearly. He said it's going to be revealed, put on open display. All of these words are carrying, all three of these, the same connotation. It is going to be so clear what you did. Nothing is going to be hidden. God will see it. And I like the little phrase he put in right at the beginning. Every man's work. There are no exceptions. Everybody's going to stand before Jesus and give an account for what they've done in this life. If you profess Jesus as Lord, if he is your savior, your building is going to be revealed. So what is it going to look like? Well, notice he says it's going to be tried by fire. It'll be tried by fire. And that's going to happen beginning of the verse for the day shall declare it. The day, the day of the Lord. His, when he is ruling, this day of the Lord is going to be try, is going to try our works by fire. Now fire, don't get the wrong impression because Fire is used in multiple ways in scripture. Fire is used as a punishment. This is not a punishment. This isn't judgment that is going to happen. If you know Jesus is your savior, you will never, never be punished for your sins. That's already done. Jesus took our punishment for all of our sins. So this is not a punishment. Some Catholicism would teach us this is the reference, probably about the only one they can come up with, where they try to make this mean purgatory. There's no such thing as purgatory. This is, has nothing to do with trying our souls. This has to do with trying the works of believers. This is not a purgatory passage. What this fire is doing, this is, I would call it an unmasking. It's it is going to burn off everything that is covering what is accurate. The fire is going to show the true character of each one of us. It's going to show our motives. It's going to show our attitudes. It's going to show our trust in God as we're doing the works that we did. All of our works are going to be shown as either the valuable or the worthless. And we decide that in this life. They're either going to survive God's scrutiny or they're going to be burned up and nothing left to show, nothing left to give. I, I like to say give. This passage does not tell us what we will do with these rewards. We know in Revelation, the 24 elders, they had crowns and they cast them at Jesus' feet. My opinion would be when we get to heaven, we're going to need nothing. All we're going to have, we're going to be wanting something to give. We're going to want to serve. We're going to want to worship. That's what I think is going to happen with these. The idea of standing before Jesus and having been saved for decades and having a, a, a coin to throw to his feet. I want, I want some treasure. I want to worship him. That should be a passion for us. And for me, this example is very sobering. God is going to scrutinize what we've done. And I, I think, I think I'm safe to say everybody in this room, everybody listening to this message, we want lasting, valuable building materials. I want God, I've told this before, I, I remember with my dad, um, before he passed away, he had this, you know, grow, growing up, he, he could do this when I was older too, but he had this, he didn't have to say a word to me. I knew so fast when I did something that was like King Stupid, just, you know, the boneheaded move of the day, he could just look at me and I just got this look. And I knew that look meant, I'm not proud of you, what you just did. I love you, but you just blew it, boy. And I felt that big. But there were times where my dad would look at me, and it was almost like, you know, almost a smile. And it was, yeah, okay, that's good. That's what I want. I want my Lord to be pleased. I want the well done. I want it. 
And if you're here today as a follower of Jesus, that is what we want. We want the gold, silver, precious stones to be what our lives are made up of. Now, that doesn't interest you, okay? And, and some people, it doesn't. If that does not interest you, you probably don't have a relationship with Jesus that's real. And we can help you with this. But if you're a follower of Jesus, having these building materials that are right, that are pure, that are good, this is a passion for us. So how do we improve this? How do we help in our own lives to be generating the right type of materials. I want to give you just a few things, basic as they come, okay? Number one, you better be praying. And when I say praying, here's what I mean. God, would you please open my eyes? I know good and well, I was praying this this morning, I know how thick-headed I can be. I know how stubborn and I know how selfish I can be. God, I need you to open my eyes. Help my motives to be right. Help me to know what, where I need to improve in these building materials. Give me wisdom. These are requests that honor God. These are according to his will. These are requests that we can make that he answers in the positive. He wants us glorifying him. Pray for this. Actively pray for it. But don't just pray. Second one, commit. Commit to being actively involved with disciple making. That is how, that, that's what we're supposed to be building is people. We need to be actively involved with disciple making. Helping each other, encouraging each other. That's what we're to do. And all of these things, there's one more I'm going to give you, submit. They all work together. They all come together. Submit, submit to following God's word. As he reveals something to you, stop making excuses. As he reveals what you need to do in your life, don't kick against it. Yes, God. That's a really, those are good words. Yes, God. And do what he tells us to do as he reveals truth, as he reveals growth areas in your life that need to happen, follow him. That's our calling. Follow him. And that's, that's going to be part of this praying, that God would open our eyes. But you got to desire it. you got to be committing your life to follow him. This is totally a matter of faith. I like the acronym for faith, forsaking all I trust him. Nothing else matters. It's all about following Jesus. That's what faith is. But what if it makes me uncomfortable? Okay, be uncomfortable in following Jesus. You're gonna be uncomfortable at times. What if it takes your time? invest invest it does it's not cheap we need to intentionally follow our lord regardless that's the key that's a good indication if you're willing to follow him regardless whatever's coming your way that's an indication that you are building with good materials and i think that's where we want to be when we follow Jesus, simply because we know this is right, I want to please him, that's what it means to walk worthy of him, trusting him. Your application statement. C.T. Studd wrote this, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. That's all that matters. And we spend so much time worrying about the here and now. And all this is going to burn. It's going to be gone. When we build for Christ, that won't be gone. And we're going to be stopping at this point for today. Next week, what we're going to see is why do we do all this? What's the why part of this? That's your point C in the next one. Why should this concern us? But for today, it really is easy to look 
at the, you know, this is the like the responsibility part of our relationship. This is, we, we need, we have a responsibility to build with good materials in our lives, in the lives of others. That responsibility is there. And it's good to remember that. It's good to know our responsibility. But listen, we need to remember the other side of it. We have an awesome privilege to be able to build on this foundation. If you know Jesus as Savior, this is a privilege. You and I, we get to do this. We have the privilege of being allowed to further or participate in a minor way in furthering the kingdom of our Savior. And I just encourage you today, don't take that lightly. Don't take lightly this privilege that we have. Understanding the gravity of this privilege, that will help us. It helps us to, to take more serious our responsibility in having that privilege. And think about how gracious God has been. God, here in these verses, he has allowed us to know. He's given us this forewarning, this foretaste. Here's what's coming, people. I am going to do this. I'm going to look at your motives. I'm going to look at your works. And I'm going to burn up everything that shouldn't be there and show you what you did for me. He warned us so that we can actively come before him and ask for his help. This is how serious he takes this. He's going to scrutinize everything we've done. But listen, be thankful for that. He's given us this forewarning. He's given us a relationship with him. And praise God, he's not left us alone. He is helping us to do this. You're not doing this by your, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. He's helping you. This is a blessing for us. This should help us to want to walk worthy of his expectations. The only way we can enter into that privileged position, position is to have a relationship with him as our Lord. If you've never called on Jesus to be your Lord, if you've never called on him to, 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 to be his follower, then you don't have this privilege. This privilege isn't yours at this point. What you have at this point is condemnation. You're in God's wrath. But here's the good news. You can come out of that wrath. God will, he, he will welcome you. He, I and mean, we would personally love to introduce you to Jesus and what it means to have him as your savior. Because that's your only hope. Let's stand for a moment. If you've never become a follower of Jesus, this privilege with its responsibilities, it can be yours. You can be forgiven. And that's our greatest need on this earth. We need to be forgiven. If you'd like to know more about that, please talk to one of us. Pull us aside. We can show you from the word of God how you can have this relationship. Christian, let's walk with Jesus so that our efforts will have both blessings in this life and in the one to come. You do business with God as he leads. Al, can you close this, please?